The thrill of travel, wild adventure and big machines on this episode of Mavericks Unlimited. A man balances on a tightrope, just 18 millimeters thick at a height of 3,500 meters. A deep abyss is directly below him and he's not even secured. We'll show his world record attempt. In addition, extreme donut drifts. We'll meet a man who can make his car spin around once every second, more than 20 times in a row. And hunting anacondas. This man hunts these large snakes in Venezuela, wading through the swamp barefoot. All this now on Mavericks Unlimited. We're in the middle of the Alps, close to San Moritz. Extreme athlete Freddie Nock wants to set a new world record. He plans to walk blindly on a thin steel tightrope without any safeguard. His colleagues laboriously try to fix the tightrope into position on the inaccessible mountain. But after they've finished, the tightrope still swings too much. Therefore, it needs to be tightened. It's stretched using six tons. Three times this amount is actually needed. But that kind of force could crack the rock and cause an avalanche. Freddy wants to break the triple world record in this higher alpine region at an altitude of 3,500 meters. He intends to walk blindly 350 meters along the highest tightrope walk over the deepest drop. That means an altitude difference of 50 meters and an incline of 14%. At its highest point, the tightrope is almost 1,000 meters above the ground. Freddy attempts his first test run. This time he's secured. However, the swinging of the tightrope is not his only problem. It also twists beneath his feet, which would be fatal during a blind record attempt. Nonetheless, using any safeguards during the actual record attempt is not an option for this son of a circus family. Ganz einfach, ich vertraue dem Zeug nicht. Meine Eltern, meine Großeltern haben immer gesagt, wir müssen uns auf uns verlassen. Also als kleiner Junge schon habe ich das eingeprägt. Und für mich ist das ein riesen Kick da, über dieses Tal zu laufen, ungesichert. Freddy is intimately acquainted with fear. It helps him cope in dangerous situations. Das sind Angstsituationen. Also wenn ich abrutsche und mich fange, dann gibt es einen, einen, einen Schock in mir. Das gibt, der Pulsschlag spüre ich hier oben. Und dann stehe ich, bin ich auf dem Seil und dann muss ich mich erst mal beruhigen. Und wow. Ey. Aber es ist immer wirklich, ich habe immer ein Gefühl, als ob etwas auf mich aufpasst. Aber mir sagt ein Gefühl, nein, es geht nicht, laufe ich nicht, mache ich nicht. Two days before the world record attempt. Freddy returns to his hotel room with a sinking feeling. The conditions are disastrous, and he's received bad news from back home. His four daughters won't be able to come because of school. But even when his family is not with him, they still ground him. I come not to St. Moritz. I am with the heart by you. I know you can do this. Such things, it gives you a strength. It's nice. It stands you again up, and they would like to be here. Just one day to go before the record attempt. Once again, Freddy can't train. He has to go up the mountain once more. Jetzt haben sie heute noch Wassertanks hingehangen, damit es mehr Gewicht hat. Weil jetzt wirklich die Schwingungen nicht rausgehen heute, dann haben wir ein Problem. Da geht's halt wirklich 1000 Meter runter und da muss ich entscheiden, was kann ich mir zumuten. Das, das beschäftigt mich jetzt. Today, Freddy flies up the mountain alone to test everything in peace. We remain at the middle station. It's uncertain whether they'll manage to solve the tightrope problem before tomorrow. The decisive day has come. At six o'clock in the morning, Freddy flies up the mountain. 
The extreme athlete hangs from a long line at an altitude of 3,500 meters. He's abseiling from the starting point. Never before has Freddy worn his non-transparent carbon helmet at this altitude. After a few attempts, he gets a nasty surprise, the thin mountain air. As soon as the 50-year-old exerts himself, he experiences a shortness of breath. Oops, hält's mich um. Ist ein bisschen schwindelig. Das ist schon schon anstrengend für mich, für einen Dorfjunge vom, weiß ich, von 600, 500 Meter über mehr. Ne? Das ist schon ein bisschen krass. Freddy braves his first test run. At the moment, he's still secured. It's still uncertain whether the rope is stable enough for him to attempt the world record without any safeguard. Freddy is having problems with his balance. The problem, he can't breathe underneath his helmet. He has to take it off. The tightrope swings wildly. Freddy is having trouble staying on. He's in danger of falling and he's running out of strength. He aborts. Hui, ist mir schwindelig, hey. Wow. Ist halt schon alles locker da. But there's no time left to adjust it. The day for the advertised world record attempt has been set. Ah, merkst du, wenn du wieder rauf. Although the conditions have never been this bad before any of his other walks, the father of five does not use any safeguards. Freddy is fighting for his life at an altitude of 3,500 meters on a tightrope only 18 millimeters wide. From now on, he can only rely on himself. No safeguards, no safety net. The rope swings wildly. Freddy almost loses his balance with every step. Keeping control is a tremendous feat of strength. The air is far too thin. Freddy is almost unconscious. He has to take a break. But the swinging rope pulls his body weight to the right. With difficulty, Freddy tries to balance this out by using his pole. Finally, Freddy does it and sits down. The extreme athlete tries to gather his strength. Below him, a free fall of 1,000 meters. But trying to get back up turns out to be a disaster. Freddy does not only have to lift himself, but also the pole weighing 40 kilos. On his second attempt, Freddy tries to get up slowly, but once again he can't find his balance. He's feeling very dizzy, but giving up is not an option. Finally, the tightrope walker is firmly standing once again. Originally, he had anticipated that the walk would take only 15 minutes, but he's already been on the rope for 20 minutes and has only got one third of the way. His strength is already dwindling and coupled with the thin mountain air at an altitude of 3,500 meters, these are conditions he's not prepared for. At the Swiss flag, Freddy has finally reached the halfway point. Wow. Ich glaube, mein Puls auf 300, hey. Wenn ich auf 400. From here on, Freddy wants to walk blindly. 
Can he risk it? No, Freddy doesn't put on his helmet. Even without it, the unsecured tightrope walker is fighting against the swinging rope and breathlessness. Nevertheless, even without the helmet, it's still possible to break the world record for the highest tightrope walk, provided he doesn't abort. Now Freddy has to face a second challenge. He has to shift his entire body weight forwards as the incline begins. He has to clear an altitude difference of 50 meters. But once he has mentally distanced himself from wearing the helmet, he proceeds quickly. Only a couple of meters to go. After 39 minutes, Freddy has finally reached the goal, thus breaking the world record. Wow. <laughs> Genial, super. Kann man gar nicht beschreiben. Bist du enttäuscht, dass du es nicht blind geschafft hast? Was ist enttäuscht? Die Enttäuschung ist da nicht zu reden. Ich, ich, mich kennt man, ich gehe auf Safety. Ich habe große Schnauze gehabt, blind, Helm, alles. Und ich sage mir einfach, ich riskiere nichts. Ich suche mir einen anderen Platz aus für den Blind. Aber dann machen wir es besser. Freddy did it and mastered the height. From Switzerland, we fly to Portugal. Nelson Rocha lives in Anis, a small town. We meet the 34-year-old car freak in his family-owned workshop. We've seen him on a video. Sim, é verdade. É verdade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But is the video real or a fake? Sim, o carro é aquele. Não, este. Okay. Sim, isto é um motor de um Peugeot 406 Coupé. Tem 218 cavalos. É um 3000 de cilindrada. Nelson has installed wide tires without tread at the front for improved traction. In addition, he has significantly shortened his Peugeot 205. Ele só puxa a tração às duas rodas da frente. So it's a front wheel drive. That's a real surprise. A second surprise awaits us when we look inside the car. There's no passenger seat because the car has to be as light as possible to do a donut. But how exactly does it work? Sim, os dois, dois aspectos mais importantes que são para conseguir fazer um donut muito rápido é conseguir primeiro o desequilíbrio do carro. É daí o, o ponto principal de, de um bom donut. A partir daí é só o carro, é só ganhar velocidade. Before he can start, Portuguese Nelson has to warm up the tires. That way the car gets the best possible traction. He doesn't seem to be particularly excited and drives the car expertly over the tarmac. One thing's for certain, he seems pretty confident. And we've got a first glimpse of his driving prowess. It's finally time. It's hard to believe what's happening in front of the camera. Nelson has not even fastened his seatbelt. As if he were in a centrifuge, the G-forces push him into his seat. And it's obvious the pressure cuts off his air supply. Sim, eu sinto-me um pouco tonto, mas, mas é, já, tô, já é o hábito. Isto é uma questão de treino, nós habituámonos e passa a ser é, quase normal. The term normal seems a bit out of place considering the images. The rotational forces even bend the car's body out of shape. What a speed. It's definitely too much for our action camera at the back of the car. We count a total of 22 revolutions in 18 seconds. We just want to know how on earth does he do it? 
isto consegue atingir a velocidade de, de, de ornito assim rápido porque deve-se a um o peso do carro está equilibrado ao centro, quer dizer que temos um motor muito pesado e uma traseira muito leve consegue formar um desequilíbrio que passa a andar só uma das rodas de tração no chão Simply Unbelievable From Portugal we fly to the swamps of Venezuela Jesus Rivas lives and works here He's one of the few snake researchers who risk getting close to these enormous reptiles, and that's in his bare feet. Normally, I'm calzado hasta el borde del agua, pero una vez que llego al agua, me siento mucho más a gusto descalzo porque puedo sentir lo que está debajo de mí. He's fascinated by anacondas the most, the largest snake in the world. When he began studying the giant snake, he barely knew anything about it. By now, he studied more than 1,000 snakes, an animal that can easily kill within just a few seconds. But Jesus isn't afraid. Bueno, yo cuando ando con Jesús, cuando lo veo que se mete a las aguas muy profundas, yo le digo, bueno, Jesús. Ahora sí me vas a hacer morder con una culebra grande, ¿no? que me falta que me muerde una grande. Y él me dice, no, 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 tranquilo. The first step is the hardest. Jesus has to surprise the snake and then immediately press its mouth closed. If he's not fast enough, it quickly becomes extremely dangerous. That's because the snakes can grow to a length of six meters and weigh more than 100 kilos. Nevertheless, Jesus has a trick, just in case the snake is faster than he is. Anacondas pudieran comer gente si, si la gente y la anaconda están en el... Si la persona va en el sitio equivocado, en el momento equivocado, el, la posibilidad existe que la anaconda se lo pueda comer. Eh, yo no he visto ninguna, no sé de ningún evento, ningún caso en que la anaconda se haya comido a alguien que yo haya podido confirmar. He oído muchísimas historias y cuando he tratado de confirmarlas, te ha resultado que no eran ciertas o han sido inconfirmables. Parece tamaño macho, pero es otra Mi familia... Uh, Tanto como mucha otra gente, eh, pensó, cuando yo empecé a estudiar anaconda, ellos pensaron que yo estaba loco. Eh, yo he marcado uh, no, aproximadamente 900 serpientes. Idealmente, uh, a mí me gustaría eh, conseguir dinero de conservación internacional eh, y poder comprar una extensión grande de tierra, probablemente como esta, similar. Eh, protegerla para conservación. Jesus catches a snake and brings it back to his laboratory. That's where he marks and measures the reptiles. Not an easy task, as they can weigh more than 100 kilos and are also highly dangerous. <laughs> Having studied such a vast number of snakes, it's not rare to encounter an old acquaintance. For the snake researcher, that's a very special moment indeed. Y si me echo una vaina, bueno, que la firmen, ¿verdad? <risa> no me va a enrollar, coño, madre. Después de cierto tiempo, hay animales que yo capturo año tras año. Llega un momento en que yo conozco al animal, ya yo sé dónde está, sé qué está haciendo. Y uno desarrolla una especie de relación personal con la serpiente. Eh, muchas veces cuando yo llego, yo cuando oye, ¿dónde estará Olivia? ¿Dónde estará Madonna? ¿Qué le habrá pasado a Mirna? Ya, ya, ya te digo cuándo. Ok, ahí la tengo. Seguro. Segurísimo. Jesus attempts to pull a sock over the snake's head. Once he's managed it, the snake will calm down and it's easier to examine it. So that he can recognize the snakes that he's caught previously, Jesus came up with a special way of marking them. For this purpose, he exploits a special property of the snake's skin. <laughs> y cinco donde van las unidades. Hablo con Jesús. Sí, dime. Jesús, este, lo que pasa es que por aquí a viejo bar, 
encontré una culebra de agua muerta, ¿viste? Sí, está muerta y... Ok, bueno, voy a, voy a verles a ver si es uno de los animales que tengo marcado. Gracias. Ok, yo espero por aquí entonces. La vida de las anacondas adultas no es fácil. Nada más comerse una comida eh, puede involucrar grandes heridas en el animal. Entonces, eh, el riesgo existe aún de los animales más grandes de que puedan haber muerto. La última vez que capturé Madonna fue en el 98, fue hace cinco años. A Madonna me acuerdo mucho porque cuando la capturamos era una hembra muy bonita. Estaba en la piel lisita, sin heridas. Al principio la llamamos Pretty Female. Y después cuando la seguimos capturando, bueno, ¿qué nombre le vamos a poner? a poner un nombre, entonces bueno, pues, Pretty Female, Madonna. Entonces le llamamos Madonna. The snakes live in Los Llanos. It rains heavily most of the year and then the swamps and shallow lakes are teeming with a myriad of giant snakes. For Jesus, it's a veritable paradise. For others, it's more like a nightmare. Yeah. A ver, espérame por aquí que yo vengo más ahora. La gente en toda la cultura judio-cristiana tiene un rechazo natural hacia la serpiente y aparentemente mientras más grandes, más rabia les tienen o más miedo les tienen. Eh, normalmente si ven una serpiente la matan al, al momento en que la ven. Jesus, on the other hand, has made it his mission to protect these snakes. Anaconda. Así venga de visita, pero siempre viene a ver sus culebras. In particular, he would like to see his Madonna again. Maybe she's the one he's just found. ¿Viste la anaconda, Jesús? Sí. Pero no era Madonna, era otra, otro animal que había marcado antes. Ah, ok. Pero era grande, ¿no? Amén. ¿Qué tú? Oye, no sé, vale, demasiado podría, demasiado podría. Este, ahí yo sería una persona feliz. Bueno, y cuando yo esté viejito, pues ver, eh, sentarme a ver la área que yo he ayudado a proteger y deleitarme de esa manera. Me da mucha curiosidad saber eh, en qué están pensando, qué están haciendo, qué es importante para ellas. Su mundo es tan distinto del nuestro. El andar de noche no, no me asusta más que andar de día. Eso es cierto que veo menos y siento que es menos, menos eficiente. Y obviamente, eh, bueno, los caimanes son más peligrosos de noche también porque son nocturnos. But at the moment, it's not the snakes that pose a problem for Jesus. It's the armed riders who ask him what he's doing. Eso no hay problema. Estaban buscando gente por ahí. Sí, están los tigreros por ahí. ¿Verdad? ¿Han, ¿Han visto algo? No, en el momento no. Ah, coño, me asustaron. Que fueron por la noche y los caballos, okay. coño, ¿qué pasó? Gracias. Bueno, suerte. Jesus keeps on searching and hopes to find a few more giant snakes tonight and thus learn even more about them. Condas son, eh, normalmente eh, cazan en emboscada, o sea, el animal se pone en un sitio donde está escondido, donde no está a la vista, y en lo que la presa se acerca, eh, es un ataque muy rápido, muy violento. Eh, agarra primero con la boca y después lanza unos lazos alrededor del cuerpo del individuo y empieza la constricción. La constricción básicamente intenta eh, comprimir el corazón tanto que el, no se puede llenar de sangre y entonces se produce un arresto circulatorio casi instantáneamente y eso es lo que mata a la presa normalmente. ¿Cómo a todo? Más o menos. ¿Por dónde ya se ha ganado? ¿Para Corocito? Para Veladero. ¿Para Veladero? Pero no llegaron a Veladero ustedes. No, nosotros llegamos a ir a Canadá hasta ahí. ¿Qué tal, compañero? Porque yo encontré una para allá. Ajá. También enrollado. Ah. Jesus sets out immediately to have a closer look at what the men have seen.
and he finds an enormous anaconda. La gente tiende a pensar que los reptiles son tontos y que no aprenden mucho. Cuando yo me acerco a un animal y este animal reacciona violentamente hacia mí, eh, a mí no me queda duda que, que es un animal que ya capturado algo. That's why he's going to take this snake with him so that he can examine it and determine whether he's caught it before. Jesus Rivas, the snake researcher in the swamps of Venezuela who risks his own life in order to save the lives of countless snakes. Mavericks Unlimited. The thrill of travel, wild adventure and big machines on this episode of Mavericks Unlimited. Searching for the most venomous sea snakes in the world, we accompany two researchers while doing their dangerous job in Northern Australia. Just one wrong move and both could lose their lives. Got him. In addition, extremely guarded, in the USA, a bunker has been converted into a housing complex. Here, the residents are supposed to be able to survive any potential catastrophe. And just don't fall. Why steel workers have a potentially deadly job despite using state-of-the-art safety systems. All this now on Mavericks Unlimited. We start in Australia, in the northern state of Queensland, or more precisely, in Weepa. This is where Dr. Brian Fry works, his job researching animal venom. My name is Dr. Brian Fry, and I'm a venom researcher at the Australian Venom Research Unit. I'm a venom hunter. For most people, snakes are terrifying, but for me, there's something fascinating. I like nothing better than going face to face with some of the most dangerous snakes in the world. The tropical waters in Northern Australia are a research paradise for the American scientist. What I do is extreme science at its best. Two to three times a year, my wife and I, Alexia, head up to Weepa to do our sea snake research. Dave! Oh, how you doing? Hi, Dave. How are you doing since the last time? Yeah, it's great to see you. Dave. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah. Good. Hey, there, buddy. Hi. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Weepa is located in the northern part of the state of Queensland in Australia. There's two big capes that form this vast, shallow, warm body of water called the Gulf of Carpeteria. What makes Weepa so special is that the animal life is absolutely amazing. It is truly a Serengeti of venom. What I'm trying to find out is how sea snakes have evolved their venom. They've changed their venom. And our quest in Weepa is to get the individual pieces that we need to form the evolution jigsaw puzzle. Brian and his team are searching for a very special type of sea snake. They set out at dusk. In the darkness, the sea snakes are easiest to catch. Let's try to stick around the seabeds tonight and see if we can get out of Stoke, since this is where we got the big one last time. Okay. It's our perfect hunting ground. The number of sea snakes here is amazing, but it's also got a staggering diversity. There's about 18 species that are found in this water. In the years that we've been searching here, we've caught 10. Our holy grail is to get a young Stoke sea snake because this is the great white of the sea snake world. So if we can get a small Stoke sea snake and get it established, it's like getting a great white to live in captivity. We're setting up these spotlights now because we need to search for the snakes at night time. Basically what happens is the snakes go down to feed at night when the fish are resting, then they come up to the surface to digest. And that's when we get them with the light, scoop them up, chuck them in the bin. When searching for Stokes sea snakes, the researchers need to be particularly careful as these reptiles are extremely dangerous. In the dark, a wrong move can happen quickly and have fatal consequences. Sea snakes are some of the most highly evolved and most toxic of all the snakes. Untreated, a sea snake bite is very likely to kill you. 
I've been bitten 24 times by venomous snakes, and Alexi has gone through four of those bites with me, including the worst, which was actually a sea snake bite. Snake, Dave, oh, snake, God. bring on the left. Coming up. Where? Right. Where to go? Just here. Right there. Go, 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 go. Dive, dive. Go down, Dave. Oh. Ah. Far up. That was big. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. This is a good area, Dave. What depth of water is it? Twenty-eight feet. Not bad. Snake. Come on, Dave. Brian and Alexia have found a snake. It's still not clear what type of snake is swimming in the water, but now everything has to happen quickly. Wow, he's away! Okay, three, two, one, go. Wow, he's pretty stiff, babe. He's not real keen. Ooh. Got him. Oh, wow. Uh, you're a nice chomper. That's a big one. Yeah, not bad. It's a this is a male spine-bellied sea snake. Only the males get these heavy spines like this. People often think of snakes as the bigger the deadlier. It's not necessarily the case. Dead is dead. A bite from a snake like this would cause absolute agony in all of your muscles and ultimately result in death unless you get the antivenom, which luckily works very, very well. Okay, let's put this in a bin by itself. So okay. we'll use this bin over here. Yep, up. And okay, yeah. three, two, one. Brian is primarily interested in one thing, the venom of sea snakes. To research how its venom works, he brings the reptile to his lab. Venom is a specialized chemical cocktail that the snakes inject to you when they bite you. What it is, is they've taken an ancient saliva gland and evolved it into this chemical arsenal factory. And it pumps out some of the most virulent poisons known to man. What I'm doing here is I'm taking this piece of plastic, laboratory pipette, and I'm sliding it over the hollow hypodermic-like needle fangs that the snakes have. And then they inject the venom into this and that allows us to collect it more efficiently. This way we capture all of the venom, which to us is quite precious. Venom is so powerful that this little bit from one fang is enough to kill two or three people. The next evening, once again, Brian and his team head out to sea. They caught a snake yesterday. Will they catch another one today? No, it's right there. On the red. Nice catch. Right here. Oh. Yeah. Bloody excellent. Oh, look, it's just had a food. Good, we can find out what it's been feeding on. Yeah. Oh. This is our holy grail for the trip. This is the rarest of the sea snakes that we've been searching for. This is a Stoke sea snake. It's only the third one that we've ever caught in all the time that we've been coming here. And it's perfect sized to establish in captivity. Full grown. This snake will have a head the size of my fist, will be about two meters long, the body about that deep. This is basically the great white of the sea snake world. This is the biggest sea snake. The fangs on an adult are almost a centimeter long, and it can give 150 milligrams of a venom that it takes only three to five milligrams to kill you of. It's just the ultimate sea snake. Bloody excellent. Awesome. Okay. Um, All right. Well, so
Brian has done it, and catching this rare snake will be a big step forward for his venom research. From Australia, our journey continues on to the center of the USA to Kansas. We're not allowed to reveal the exact address, as time and again people have tried to force their way in here. We meet the creator of what is meant to be the safest place in the world. That other people show up with guns and our guns were bigger than their guns and you know they got arrested and you know it's been, um, it's a serious business. We arrive after a half hour drive through uninhabited countryside. Our first impression, a very high level of security. There are cameras and heavily armed watchmen all over the place. You'll see the level of security when we get out here. It's uh, nothing to be messing with. If you're starting to climb the fence and damage the property and try to uh, hurt people that are there, we can shoot back. After a full body search, we're allowed to enter the complex. But what's so valuable here? The answer awaits us inside. Larry Hall, the owner, has converted a dilapidated nuclear missile silo built during the Cold War into luxury housing. It's claimed the residents can survive any type of potential catastrophe. The so-called luxury survival condo goes down 14 levels below ground and provides accommodation for up to 75 people. There is a separate pool, cinema, medical practice, supermarket and much more. An autonomous town covering 17,000 square meters. If you have the right amount of small change, that is, the starting price here is $1.4 million. Residential level five. Larry spends most of his life down here. As the founder of this housing complex, he's responsible for the safety of all apartment owners. Every morning, he checks whether a catastrophe is imminent. Owing to his previous government job and work at NASA, he knows secret sites that can provide him with this information. Today we have a 45% chance of an X flare, which is uh, the strongest rated uh, solar flares. These are the kind of flares that with a coronal mass ejection and it's pointed towards the earth right now. So we're keeping our eye on this because we're in a kind of a danger situation there that could definitely impact a lot of people globally. The bunker has its own specifically developed alarm system. Each resident has an app that immediately informs them about any potential dangers. Orange indicates a potential catastrophe and red means that all residents are to go to the bunker immediately. A solar storm could increase the alarm status from green to orange. Despite the dangerous situation, Larry has arranged a viewing with a potential customer. Dawn Snyder has three children and is looking for secure housing in case there's a catastrophe. Larry wants to prove to her that she doesn't need to sacrifice on comfort. It's that easy to open then? Very easy, okay. yeah. But it's also very protective. Deepest in the middle down by the... A pool and spa area behind steel doors. These are meant to provide the residents with something to take their minds off things and prevent depression during longer stays. Larry sought advice from psychologists on how to organize life underground. You can uh, get a cup of coffee in the morning, come up here, be around some trees, have some high volume ceilings. Um, if you have any little dogs, we've got a pet park over here. And even the dog's business is dealt with. An anti-odor spray keeps the air clean by the neighboring climbing wall. The viewing continues eight levels below ground. Here, there is an inviting library in which to read and relax. Next door, there is another of Larry's key projects. He has also thought about the children's education in the event of a catastrophe. We envision the moms maybe coming down here and being next door while the kids are in the classroom over here. A digital classroom. This is where Dawn's children could go to school one day. Learning on computers which have a comprehensive library and parts of the internet saved on them. And uh, teachers, instructors, you have that on site yeah. then? You rotate. You will be a teacher for one month. I will be a teacher for one month. 
In an emergency, every resident has to work four hours a day doing various jobs when the bunker is closed. Therefore, Dawn would have to regularly teach her own children. Rotating jobs, psychologists believe, will help the residents cope with being locked inside. And finally, the luxury apartment in which Dawn and her children would live. The whole level is about 170 square meters and can accommodate up to 10 people. And the cost, just over $3.1 million. And she doesn't even have to go without an outside view. And what is this? Those are electronic windows. Those let you know that you are not underground. Um, everything has these um, electronic iPads that let you control um, what you have. So we're in this room. As it were, these are the windows to the outside world. You can choose from one of three cameras installed outside or from additional programs. It was a uh, real hot day and Mark and I had been outdoors and we were sunburned. We came down and we go, I need, to, you know what, I'm putting the snow scene on. So I have this wooded mountain scene. I put the snow on and we turned the fireplace on and we're sitting there going, ah, I feel cooler already. Dawn appears to be convinced about the apartment's furnishings. Next best thing. If yeah. it's not safe to go outside, um, at least to be able to, to look out. Following the viewing, Dawn is convinced that she could imagine herself living here because the world outside doesn't seem safe anymore. What are we scared of? And just the world falling apart. And I think it's uh, every day we get closer and closer to it. And I, I feel better already knowing, um, you know, we're planning for our future, um, for our safety, and, and we're going to be okay. Larry now needs to prepare for a possible solar storm. Mark Minoski assists him. These two men have known each other for 15 years. Together, they developed the concept for the bunker. Mark also spends most of his time below ground. We have 20,000 gallons of diesel fuel stored underground. Let's open up the generators and check their status. The bunker has two high-performance generators. They are capable of producing electricity for at least two and a half years. I'm going to put it back in the automatic mode so that if there is a power outage, it will be available for uh, service. But Larry and Mark are not only prepared for sunstorms, they have a solution prepared for any potential catastrophe. Particularly important, air for breathing. That's why there are various filter systems that protect the air from being contaminated radioactively or biochemically. Larry's luxury bunker is protected by an electric fence, dozens of high-resolution security cameras and a remote-controlled drone. These can all be monitored and controlled by Larry from a room underground. Apart from a few farmers in the area, nothing attracted his attention today. The alarm is set to green, pure secured luxury, and brilliant future prospects. This is a thousand year structure. It, it will just be here forever. And thus, the day ends in what must probably be the safest place in the world, somewhere in Kansas. We now leave the USA and head to Frankfurt in Germany, where we go straight to a 140 meter drop. Carsten Bachmann is a steel worker. He has worked on precipices for 30 years and has already witnessed the deaths of several colleagues. It is traurig, but it happens immer mal wieder. Despite using state of the art safety systems, this is because a fall is still life threatening today, even if the worker is attached to a safety cable. Ja, wenn ich jetzt hier runterfallen würde, denn normalerweise ich habe 20 Minuten. 20 minutes to be rescued from the safety cable. Und dann wäre es das für mich gewesen. In an experiment, we want to find out why it's so dangerous when steel workers fall using a safety cable. What happens when the worker is hanging over a sheer drop? 
These two experts are going to help us find out. Dieter Stopper, a mountain guide and climbing pro, and Dr. Marco Einhaus from the German Steelworkers Trade Association, an expert in falling accidents. To ensure that no one gets hurt, Dr. Andreas Kuppel from Munich's Mountain Rescue Service is also on hand. We want to know why steel workers' safety harnesses can become so dangerous. We decide to compare them to climbing harnesses. Das ist die Stahlbauerausrüstung, ein sogenannter Auffanggurt. Das, was er hier hat, ist ein weiches Seil mit einem Sitzgurt aus dem Bergsport. The rope is attached to the climbing harness at the front of the body, which is unsuitable for steel workers. Wenn er jetzt schweißen muss oder flexen oder was auch immer im Stahlbau, dann kann das Seil durchtrennt werden und damit würde er runterfallen. Deswegen haben wir eine Rückenöse und binden die Leute am Rücken an. Thus, a steel worker always has his rope behind him. However, being suspended at the back has consequences if there's a fall. This falling test will demonstrate the reason why. First, Dieter with a normal climbing rope. In order to determine the forces acting on his body when the rope breaks his fall, we attach it to a measuring device. Just like on an indoor climbing wall, Dieter's safety is assured by a belayer on the ground. No big deal. The impact force using a climbing rope amounted to 250 kilos. Es tut überhaupt nicht weh. Das ist wie wenn Sie sich im Fernsehsessel langsam reinsinken lassen. Genauso fühlt sich's an. Richtig schön. Because his belayer helps absorb the impact force, but steel workers don't use belayers or a flexible rope to help break their fall. Überall, wo man klettert, ist das in Ordnung. Aber das Seil dehnt sich dermaßen stark, wie man hier sieht, dass man praktisch auch am Boden oder an irgendeinem Stahlbauteil anschlagen könnte. Das ist zu weich, das System. Das können wir im Stahlbau nicht gebrauchen. Only hard systems are viable. So hard that we cannot test the steelworkers' equipment using a person and have to use a dummy instead. The cable is short, only two meters long, and at the back there's a built-in shock absorber. Das sorgt dafür, dass die Energie durch das Aufreißen der Nähte reduziert wird. But shock absorbers when falling can never replace the safety of a belayer or a short cable, a long elastic rope. But what happens to the steel worker if he falls? The short cable breaks the fall abruptly. The impact force 680 kilos. Unglaublich bei der an sich überschaubaren Fallhöhe. He falls two meters, but his impact on the cable is seven times his body weight, the upper limit of what a person can withstand. Im Körper wird Wetschungen geben, Prellungen, Blutergüsse, unter Umständen Rippenbrüche unter Umständen auch Läsionen an der Wirbelsäule. The steel worker would survive even if he's injured in the process, but he can't just abseil to the ground. He's left helplessly dangling in the air. Steel workers know the consequences of hanging in this system all too well, but they constantly have to maneuver into awkward situations in this job. Thus, Carsten Bachmann has already seen several colleagues hanging. Es gibt Leute, die lächeln dann danach. Es gibt Leute, die lächeln dann nicht mehr, weil man hängt ja doch anderthalb, zwei Meter tiefer. Und wenn dann keiner ist, der dich hochholen kann oder du hast kein Höhenrettungssystem, dann sieht's schlecht aus. Why does the cable that initially saves the steelworker's life subsequently become a pitfall when hanging? In order to find out, Dieter Stopper is prepared to hang in the steelworker's harness from a forklift truck. For a comparison, Dr. Marco Einhaus hangs next to him in a climbing harness. We have a little bit of in the bauch. This is not so easy here. At some point, hanging freely can become life-threatening. That's why Dr. Köppel permanently monitors their blood circulation, oxygen intake, and blood pressure. 
wenn es denen plötzlich schlecht geht, dann können wir innerhalb von Sekunden das Experiment abbrechen. Time to begin. Two meters in the air. Dieter feels the effects of hanging from his back immediately. He can hardly move at all in his harness. Ich hänge wie ein nasser Sack, ich kann mich eigentlich kaum regen. Völlig bewegungsloses Hängen. His body's center of gravity is hanging forwards. Too much weight is pressing against his extremities. And compared to the climbing harness? Ich kann mich ganz gut bewegen eigentlich, wegen der vorderen Aufhängung. Being suspended from the front, the body almost swings at its center of gravity, thus remaining relatively mobile and comfortable. However, being suspended from the back is already uncomfortable in the second minute. Das schneidet ein, das schneidet hier im Brustbereich ein. Die Schenkel, die schneiden extrem ein. Man sieht hier und hier. Ich merke, dass es mühsam ist für meinen Körper, das Blut durch meinen Körper zu pumpen. Der Puls ist von 80, jetzt auf 130 angestiegen. Das zeigt also eine Kreislauffehlregulation an. After only two minutes. What's happened exactly? A so-called hanging trauma is imminent. Owing to the loss of mobility, the blood is collecting in his legs and can't flow back to the rest of the body. His heart and brain aren't being supplied with enough blood. Dieter feels this lack of oxygen in just the third minute. Also ich merke jetzt, dass es mir leicht schwindelig wird, dass ich sie jetzt demnächst doppelt sehe. That's the lack of oxygen and Dr. Köppel aborts the experiment. Innerhalb der nächsten drei bis fünf Minuten, denke ich, wäre er bewusstlos geworden. That means after a fall, steel workers have approximately eight minutes before losing consciousness. And after just 20 minutes, internal organs will fail. In contrast, they could hang from a climbing harness for hours without any problem. Now we know why steel workers have one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Mavericks Unlimited.